This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beattie of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during November. In this episode, you'll get all the details on a total lunar eclipse, check out three bright planets in the evening sky, get the lowdown on the celestial queen, and get ready for three meteor showers. So grab your curiosity and come along on this month's Sky Tour. The big news this month, celestially speaking, is not that almost all the United States returns to standard time on November 6th. You know, fall back and all of that. Instead, it's that a total lunar eclipse occurs just two nights later, early on November 8th. And just like the lunar eclipse last May, everyone in the contiguous U.S. will have a chance to see a totally eclipsed moon, weather permitting, of course. Those of you out west have the geometric advantage, though you'll have to be up after midnight to watch the show. Along the east coast, totality will be ending roughly at or just after sunrise. Meanwhile, the totally eclipsed moon will be almost directly overhead, as seen from Hawaii, and it's an early evening event for far eastern Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. So here are the key events given in Pacific Standard Time. Just change these to match your own time zone. If you can remember just one number, it's 2.59 a.m. PST. That's the midpoint of the eclipse, when the moon will be closest to the center of Earth's deep shadow, called the umbra. Totality starts about 45 minutes sooner than that and lasts 45 minutes later. You'll see the start of the partial eclipse when the moon begins its plunge into the umbra at 1.09 a.m. and the last bit of the lunar disk emerges from the umbra at 4.49 a.m. If you didn't catch those times, you can get more details at skyandtelescope.org or in the magazine's November issue. This eclipse offers two rare treats. First, it occurs during the annual display of southern torrid meteors, which are bits of dust shed by Comet Enki. Usually, the torrids offer only a weak display, though the shower endures for several weeks. This year, however, there's some expectation among meteor specialists that an intense swarm of torrids might bring higher rates and perhaps numerous bright fireballs between the end of October and about November 10th. So, will shooting stars pepper the sky during totality on November 8th? The second treat involves the planet Uranus, which will lie just a couple of degrees to the moon's east during the eclipse. Now, regular listeners of Sky Tour realize that I've never, ever suggested that you try to spot Uranus. It's usually just too faint to see by eye. But, coincidentally, this distant planet reaches opposition on November 8th, putting it closest to Earth and so it will be at its brightest, about magnitude 5.6. It should be easy to spot with binoculars during totality, especially for those of you in western North America, and if you've got a clear, super dark sky, free of light pollution, you just might be able to spot it with your unaided eye. The November issue of Sky and Telescope tells you how to try that, and if you succeed, give yourself a big pat on the back. Speaking of light pollution... Did you know that by just looking at the stars you can contribute to science? No joke! Globe at Night is a long-running citizen science effort that asks folks just like you all around the world to estimate how much light pollution they have. Those results are then tabulated by lighting researchers to compare with photos taken by satellites of the Earth at night. No equipment or experience is needed, so here's what you need to do you'll be looking to see how many stars you can spot in and around the constellation Pegasus, which is about halfway up in the southeast once it gets dark. Go to the project's website, globeatnight.org. Then download and print out the star chart for Pegasus, or download the chart to your smartphone. Then head outside some dark, clear evening when the moon isn't in the sky, and find a place where there aren't any bright lights in view. Give your eyes at least 10 minutes to adjust to the darkness and look toward southeast to find Pegasus. Match what you see in Pegasus by eye to one of the charts. The more light pollution you have, the fewer stars you'll see. Then go inside and report your observation on the website. Easy, right? 
and you'll feel great about having contributed to science. So, one more time, that website is globeatnight.org. Since full moon falls on November 8th, this month begins with that big bright disk in the evening sky. First quarter is on November 1st, last quarter on the 16th, new moon on the 23rd, and another first quarter at month's end. With the switch back to standard time, it'll start getting dark by about 5 p.m., and there's plenty to see after nightfall. Look towards southeast to spot Jupiter, which is unmistakable and brighter than anything else in the evening sky. Well, aside from the moon, of course. Now clench your fist and hold it at arm's length. That fist is about 10 degrees across, and four fists to the right of Jupiter, over in the southwest, is a medium-bright star kind of on its own. That's actually the planet Saturn. And by 9 p.m., far to Jupiter's left, you can spot ruddy-colored Mars rising over the eastern horizon. To help you figure out what's what, the Moon is parked very close to Saturn on November 1st and again on the 28th. It's dramatically close to Jupiter, less than 3 degrees away, on November 4th. And it's not far from Mars on the 10th and 11th. So, if you're keeping count, that's three of the five brightest planets in the evening sky. And Uranus is a special bonus this month. Venus and Mercury are out of sight right now, though Venus will start showing up after sunset during December. Okay, let's take stock of the stars in the evening sky. As darkness falls, look high up in the west, directly above the sunset point, and you'll see our old friends, the three bright stars of the Summer Triangle. Vega, at lower right, is the brightest. Deneb is above it by about two or three fists, and Altair is farther off to Vega's left. I suppose Summer Triangle is a misnomer, because you'll be able to see this striking trio well into December. Turn to your left, down below Jupiter near the southern horizon, and about two fists to the left of Saturn. The only decently bright star in that part of the sky is Fomalhaut. Now, it's got a weird spelling, and you might have heard it called Fomaho, but that's not being true to its Arabic roots. Depending on your latitude, Fomahut is above the horizon by two or three fists. This lonely beacon is sometimes called the Autumn Star. It's part of the dim constellation known as Pisces Australis, the southern fish, and in fact, in Arabic, the name means Mouth of the Fish. Around mid-November, Look for Fomahot at 7 p.m. and note what's below it along your horizon. That direction is due south. If you do an about-face to look due north, you'll find Polaris, the North Star, roughly halfway from the horizon to overhead. Don't expect to be dazzled by Polaris. It's only half as bright as Fomahot. About three fists to the upper right of Polaris, you'll see a group of five medium-bright stars crudely shaped like a three, or maybe like a broad W tipped up on its left corner. This is the constellation Cassiopeia, who is a queen in Greek mythology. You might imagine those stars outlining the chair or throne that she's sitting on, rather than the queen herself. The somewhat dimmer stars of Cepheus, her husband, are just to the queen's left. They look a bit like an upside-down house. Ancient poets say Cassiopeia was queen of either Ethiopia or Joppa, the city now called Jaffa in Israel. In any case, she was both beautiful and boastful. To punish the queen's arrogance, Poseidon, lord of the sea, unleashed a flood and sent the monster Cetus to ravage her land. The only way to stop it was to chain the royal couple's daughter, Andromeda, to a rock. Luckily, the hero Perseus was on his way home from having killed Medusa, he swoops in to save Andromeda, then claims her in marriage. Meanwhile, Cassiopeia's misdeeds landed her up in the sky, doomed to hang upside down half the time, and clinging to her throne so she doesn't fall off. All these mythical players are in the same part of the sky. For example, you can find the splash of medium-bright stars that mark Perseus by starting at the three of Cassiopeia and looking two or three fists lower down. To the queen's right, by about two fists, is Andromeda. Go a little farther to the right, and closer to overhead, to spot the great square of the constellation Pegasus, the winged horse. In some tellings of Andromeda's rescue, Perseus is riding Pegasus. 
The dim stars of Cetus, the sea monster, are three or four fists below the great square. November is the peak of three meteor showers. I've already mentioned the southern torrids, a modest shower that peaks on November 5th. They'll be washed out by a bright moon, except during the total lunar eclipse on November 8th. A week later, the 12th, marks the peak of the northern torrids, also a weak shower, this time with less interference from the moon. Then come the Leonids, peaking before dawn on the 17th. This shower's parent comet, called Temple Tuttle, tends to create narrow, concentrated streams of debris that produced prodigious displays of shooting stars in the late 1990s when it last swung close to the sun. Since then, this shower usually offers little more than a trickle of shooting stars that radiate from the sickle asterism in Leo. Now, Leo doesn't rise until well after midnight, but there might be good reason to watch for them this month. More than one meteor dynamicist predicts that this year's Leonid display will be enhanced by a pulse of particles that were ejected by the comet in 1733, nearly three centuries ago. For those of you in North America, the predicted arrival is during the early morning hours of November 19th. One optimistic dynamicist predicts that these meteors will be generally bright and you might see at least 100 per hour from a dark sky sight. Let's hope he's right. Thanks for letting me expand your celestial horizons for another month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed listening, please leave a rating or review. It'll help spread the word about Sky Tour, and I really welcome your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and is produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, we'll officially welcome the red planet Mars to the evening sky. Until then, I wish you clear skies.